Okay, so uh, uh, what was that Harry Edison one? Uh, yeah, that was Harry Edison. Uh, we call him Sweet. Uh, yeah, yeah, there's little yeah, Sweet. Yeah. Uh, well, you seem to know the saxophone player. Why yeah, it looked like Tony Crisp to me. <laughs> yeah, it looked like Tony Crisp. Now, that surprised me. When we were watching that, you sort of get really excited by yeah. that, the, the Joe Turner thing. And I've always thought of it just as a blues man came from the country and then became a little bit more electrified, a little bit more sophisticated. But you seem to get excited by the jazz, the Kansas City Count Basie kind of feel that, that we've just seen. Yeah. Before. Well, you know, at that time they used to have a guy called Walter Brown and naturally, as you mentioned, Basie with uh, Jimmy Rush and, and people like that. And they, that, that was that sophisticated blues. Oh, mm. oh, listen at that. I didn't know I could even say it. But that was the sophisticated part of the blues that uh, many still play today. Mm. I wish I could. Well, you, you turned to me and said, I'd like to have played that yeah, kind of blues. Yeah. But, but what do you mean? Did, did you want to ever be a jazz musician? Well, not really, but just almost. <laughs> I'd like to be able to play with jazz musicians, then play with the bluesy blues musicians, and then kind of be in between. Now, that's what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you what, we, we, we'll talk about your whole life now, um, because you certainly didn't start off on a jazz basis, on a musical basis at all. You were working, as we said at the start, in the fields in, in yeah. Mississippi. It's amazing that, that mm -hmm. you know, in, in our time this did happen, but there you are. I used to pick cotton, man. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, exactly. you walk behind a mule. Uh, don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, yes, I did. But I graduated from that. I started to drive tractors. Oh, wait a, minute. Let, wait a minute. Let, let, let's set this a little bit. <laughs> what age were you? I mean, what age were you when you left school? Well, let me say it this way. I lost my mother when I was nine years old. I lived alone from the time I was nine until I was almost 14, and during that time I left school. And my father found me later on, and he brought me back. Now, at that time, I was living up around a place called Kilmichael, Mississippi. And I lived with a family, a white family, and I was what they called a houseboy there. I used to work for them, a family called the Cotlitz family, which to me was like my own family. They treated me like that. They had one son named Wayne Cotlitz. Uh, this was Mr. and Mrs. Flick Cotlitz. Um, in fact, he passed on, but Wayne is still alive, and I think the Mrs. is still alive. In fact, I'm, uh, I'm hoping, anyway, because it was a beautiful family. Anyway, I used to work there for, the, for them, and they would let me go to school. I had to walk about five miles to school, because during that time there were no school buses for blacks in that area. And um, I would do my chores, like milk 20 cows a day, and then I would, well, 10 in the morning, that is, 10 at night, uh, when I'd come back in from school. And after I would be in school, come back and do my chores, and then I was just like the regular guy around the house, you know, mm -hmm. doing the housework. But where actually did you get the first guitar? It's all right saying I was walking <laughs> around the fields, <laughs> and suddenly I found a guitar. Now, come on, where did, where did you get the first guitar? Well, Mr. Flake Cartlidge. Um, got my first guitar for me. I'd found a person that was in the area that had this guitar, and he wanted $15 for the guitar, the person that was going to sell it. So I spoke to Mr. College, which I was, as I said, working as a houseboy then, and I made $15 a month at that time. And I asked my boss, Mr. College, if he would get it for me, so he said yes. And he paid for it, and I had, I remember having to pay him back half of my month's salary <laughs> <laughs> the first month and then half the uh, the next month. And believe it or not, it was a little guitar about, uh, not as long as this Lucille, but about two-thirds the length of it, called a Stella. Stella, a little red Stella guitar with a round hole in it in mm -hmm. here for the sound. And um, Just that an was acoustic guitar? Yes, yeah. acoustic guitar. Well, <laughs> John, a lot of people... Uh, probably will find it hard mm. to believe, but at that time there was no electricity in the okay. area. <laughs> yeah, it's not where we lived in the country. That <laughs> well, that was my first guitar, and uh, as I used it in church and with the quartet, what we talked about earlier. Sure. In fact, they used to didn't want you to sing and uh, play guitar in the Baptist churches. The Baptist, Methodist, and uh, Catholic churches didn't really care for the guitar, but I used it in the sanctified church, the Church of God in Christ, they call so they it. So they saw it in some ways as sinful. Yes, yes, they are. Yeah, the gospel, the first music that you, the very you remember hearing? The first, uh, 
the first that I was allowed to try to sing. <laughs> Uh, I heard of Blind Lemon and Lonnie Johnson, people like that, through my aunt, which was sort of like a teenager today. She, w she would buy the big 7-8 records. And um, we would all sing gospel songs, though, around the house. You weren't allowed to sing any blues. Can you remember any of those gospel songs that you used to sing then? Well, not really. I think I've got one that I... For you, I might try just a little <laughs> taste you. of it. You promise you won't laugh at me. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am one. Take my hand through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me on. You make me do anything. <laughs> Thank you, V. But you see, that, that raises a problem almost. That uh, sure, the the style of playing church music probably is far more European based, the European hymns, but. The feeling that we were talking about earlier is what you also put into there. Are we saying that the only real difference between blues and gospel is perhaps the subject matter? Yes. Well, uh, if you think of it the way I always do, uh, being brought up in church, in gospel music as I was, I always thought that singing in the church, you always sing about heavenly bodies. Blues, you sing about the earthly ones. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's important here to just to fill in a little bit about your, your life outside of music at this time, because here in Britain in the middle of the 1980s, we can't imagine, I think, quite what it was like. We're not talking about slavery days. We're not talking about civil war. No. But you're still talking about the situation, presumably, where most black people expected to work on the land. Who owned the land? Uh, usually, you was a sharecropper. In other words, the, uh, the owner was a person uh, like my boss had... Uh, many acres, uh, acres, sure. if you will, of well, land. We're talking about a white guy owning yes. land, well, basically. Most of them was white. You yeah. did have a few blacks that owned land in the area as well. Yeah. But the situation was the same. In other words, he would give what we call a furnish. That is, he would loan you X amount of money per month. Usually a family of 10 maybe would get maybe 40 or $50 per month. This mm -hmm. was your allowance, in a way of speaking, or a loan on what you were expected to make later on on mm -hmm. your crop. And a uh, man and wife, like myself and my wife, when I was married, uh, about 15 to $20 a month. Or so he'd like sort that. of lease you a plot of land and say, look, we'll share the profits. I'll let you have uh, the use well, of that. Yeah, that was... That sharecropping. It should have been like that. <laughs> 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 but generally, usually, most of us never realize any real money from it because in most cases, you had spent up what you made by the end of the year, you know, I, I remember uh, uh, many times having to live the last week, you might say, of that month with your allowance, uh, if you will. Uh, you get, you and your wife, 15 or $20 a month. And think about your groceries and your other things that you needed, clothing and all that had to come out of this 20 or $25, no more yeah. than $25 for two people. And um, I'd run out of food. And many times we would use, uh, dig up potatoes that we had planted in the garden, dig up the potatoes, dust the meal out of the keg or the barrel where we had meal for, for mm. bread. And we would make soup out of these potatoes. And many times I went hunting and would kill uh, like rabbits and coons, squirrels mm. and things of that sort to try to make it that last week. Yeah. you know, before we get another allowance. So it was sort of subsistence farming, you know, you farm uh, just to survive for the yes, next, yes, next yes. year. Yes, that's what it was. Mm -hmm. So you never had any, uh, you couldn't do like the squirrel, you had no acorns <laughs> <laughs> put up for the winter. Were there any white workers, though, on the, on the land? Yes, the there were some that uh, went through the same thing. There were some white sharecroppers, just as it was black, mm -hmm. but not nearly as many. Yeah, I can remember I mean, reading a story that you told some years ago, which <laughs> summed up the situation for you. I think it was during the war, and German prisoners of war yes. were brought over to work the land. Right. And they were really being punished. They were prisoners of war. Yes. But 
they uh, would only they would bring them out to work about nine o'clock in the morning when we would have been out there from what we call kin to kent. Uh, kin means until you can see <laughs> in the morning, and can't mean until you cannot see in the evening. But they would bring the prisons, uh, prisoners, I should say, out about nine o'clock, and they would let them work until around four thirty or five in the evening, and they would take them back to the camp. But we still had to be out there. So in a lot of cases, we felt that they was treated, in many cases, much better yeah, than we so were. So they were the enemy, but they got a better deal than yes, you got. Right. <laughs> Um, just to get back to the music then, at what stage did you suddenly think, I want to be a blues man? Well, when I went in the Army, it was the first time that I'd ever been away from home. In other words, from Indianola, we had to go to Hattiesburg, Mississippi, to a camp called Camp Shelby, Mississippi, which is still down there today. Mm -hmm. And after being in the Army there and with my guitar down, uh, people seemed to like what I did, mm -hmm. singing other things. Well, when I came back home, I got this smart idea that on the weekends, I would go away from Indianola, maybe like to Moorhead or to Edavina, to uh, Greenville or How Greenville. How many miles would this be? Uh, from Indianola, Moorhead was like about 10 or 12 miles. Uh, Greenwood was like about 25 miles. How'd you get there? Hitchhike. <laughs> <laughs> Hitchhike there, and I had to play in the play to make enough money to get back on the bus. That's really the place to get back home. And I would sit on the seat corners and play. And the reason why... Just a minute. You went, you, so you weren't actually going and playing in a club or a no, bar? No, no, no. You were just sitting corner. on the street? Yeah. In a place where I could have... Uh, I could always find the right spots where the blacks you live in, neighborhood blacks would have uh, this street maybe like uh, here that would... Uh, across the main street going into the main part of town where you would have both white and blacks passing. So it was kind of like uh, mm. uh, the crossing cross of the street yes, here. Yes, yes. So I could uh, sit in this corner and I could, you know, kind of get the attention of everybody to pass. And usually people that would pass would ask me to sing a gospel song, would always compliment me very nicely. They would say, son, if you keep playing, one day you're going to really be great. But they never tipped. But the people <laughs> that would ask me to sing and play a blues tune, you know, then they would always give me a, a little tip, maybe a dime, a quarter, something like that. And then they would say to the other people that would gather around me, why don't you give the kids up and go see you sing it? And maybe even a beer would follow that. And I think that was my motivation. Who was the first inspiration for you as a player? You're, you, we, you're a guy who can play now. We've got you with a guitar. You're <laughs> playing. You, you, you're known, even if you're only working on the sidewalk for, for dimes and so on. But who was it that you thought, I want to sound like that guy? Well, this is kind of a, uh, I think it's a little bit complicated, but let me try and... When my aunt um, uh, that would buy these records that I was tell telling you about earlier, the teenager, uh, would buy records by Blind Lemon, and she bought them by many other people. That included Led Belly and many others. But something I would hear from Blind Lemon that would just was like go through me like a sword. Well, I heard the same thing from Lonnie Johnson. So these two people, when I was a very small boy, I'm talking about before a teenager, uh, that ring in my head, and it still does. Even today, I carry a tape of Blind Lemon and one of Lonnie Johnson and my shoulder bag with me all the time. But then as I grew up, I started to hear uh, jazz was beginning to creep in the area, like Charlie Christian, and then, uh, 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 then I started hearing of the big bands, as you mentioned, Count Bass and uh, Joe Turner. I was hearing Joe Turner, believe it or not, mm -hmm. way back there. Um, you know, Al Hibbler, uh, or Walter Brown, and people uh, that sing at Singers that time. as well as guitarists. Right. Mm -hmm. yes, yes. But those guitarists, the ones I mentioned, uh, Lonnie Johnson, Blind Lemon, those was the first that really influenced me. But then I heard of a guy called T-Bone Walker. And man, when I heard of T-Bone Walker, oh, that did it. I mean, T-Bone was playing But what was, what was the difference? Because Blind Lemon Jefferson, uh, uh, presumably the, the same sort of sound that we've already heard from Barney Hopkins, for instance, country blues, something along those lines. But what was it about T-Bone Walker that you thought, oh, this is something different? All right, if you will. Uh, let me see if I can get it too. 
All right, now, for instance. For instance, Blind Lemon to me was like... Even more, even then, that's why I call him kind of a... Uh, blues, oh, my ass is right key. <laughs> blues jumped arriving, running with solid mind. Something like that, I guess. The first would have been the older one, and then the last one was T-Bone Walker. When I heard things like that, man, I said, oh, God, I, please, I just got to have a guitar. <laughs> and that's what made me want to really play. Yeah, but you feel that the early guys then were possibly, the, the guitar was the background. Yeah. You, mm -hmm. It's forming right. the rhythm, mm -hmm. and they were singing over that rhythm. Yeah, they but sang over it. With T-Bone Walker, you felt yeah, there was... single strings, single strings, and electric yeah. guitar at that. So there's a melodic line that the guitar oh, could sing. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, man. Oh, God. I was kind of like... Um, you know, when you smell the fragrance of food and you, like in a cartoon, you're just floating behind it, you know, that's the way I was by the time.